Okay, so thanks everybody for coming to this. Thanks to Jacob for organizing this one and, and for his series. I've really enjoyed the, 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 the ones in the series that I've, I've seen. I'm seeing the, seeing the ones I haven't seen because I know he puts them online. Um, so I'm very happy for, to do this because I'm just finishing a book which is uh, the culmination of work I've been doing on the nature of laws and the nature of probabilities. Um, oh, I don't know. It's been, and, and the nature of counterfactuals and causation for the last 20 years or so, or even longer. And I'm very interested in getting feedback about some of the ideas here. Um, I, I called the title of my book, originally I called it, What Breathes Fire Into the Equations. And uh, of course, that's a quote from, from Hawking. But now that I'm thinking about my view, my view is more like putting the fire out of the equations. At least that's how it'll appear to some people. Uh, but I'll still keep, keep with that title. And I hope so. Okay. Um, so that's what this is going to be about. It's about a view about laws and chances. That's a descendant of a view that's been being developed within the, the community of people who think about the metaphysics of, of, of science, metaphysics of physics particularly. Um, it's a descendant of David Lewis's views, but different from his views and uh, uh, critical of his views. And I think the ways I'm going to be critic criticizing his views and developing a, a new view uh, has a lot of payoffs for a lot of issues that are of interest to philosophers of, of, of physics who are interested in the metaphysics of physics. I've been interested in this ever since I was an undergraduate and, and, and I took a course, actually a couple of courses in which probability was talked about. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I remember going to my teachers and saying, what in the world is probability anyway? And, um, you know, I was told various things, uh, which, you know, you all know about. Uh, none of these views seem to be satisfactory. And when I saw what David Lewis was sort of thinking about, I thought this was, while well, not worked out in a sufficient detail, basically a really interesting, sort of a new guy on the block though, related to other ideas. Um, I see one of the other people here is, is someone I just saw in Argentina really recently, it's Carl Hoofer. And he also has a book on this and he and Carl developed a, a Lewis's ideas in a somewhat different way from the way I, I do it, but also something I can recommend to you to, to well, look at. Oops, okay, let me make sure I get this thing working right now. Good, okay, so the first thing I wanna just begin with is a little bit of history of the concept of laws of nature, in my view. Um, it's interesting to me that as far as I know, there's no comprehensive study of the history of the concept of laws of nature. If somebody knows something different, I'd be interested to hear that. There's some very good articles about the early notion of uh, history of the concept of laws when it, it sort of took, really took off in the 17th and 18th century, um, particularly with uh, Galileo, Descartes, and of course, Newton, but many other people then too. And later about Kant's views about laws and, um, and, and the 19, also in the 19th century. But I don't know of any comprehensive study. My understanding of the way the idea of laws of nature um, took root in the 17th century was um, the idea that there would be a comprehensive theory which specified principles that describe both how celestial objects moved and how um, objects on earth moved and maybe would cover the motions of all things. And the way it was understood by some people, maybe by Descartes, who's a little equivocal exactly what goes on, is that these principles described how God moves things around. They were mathematical because God was a mathematician and so fairly straightforward and simple. And he exhibited various kinds of symmetries and so on. But of course, Descartes didn't get them right. But think of this as Descartes' dream. Descartes' dream was kind of like what Stephen Weinberg's dream 
later on, if you look up something like a final theory of the motions of all things. And since all changes maybe could be attributed to the changes of the motions of things, I'm not sure Descartes had that idea, but he might have. And certainly that's an idea that grew later. Um, this would be a comprehensive mathematical theory of the world. Now for Descartes, it did leave out the motions of human bodies because he thought that human minds were exempted from this, but that's not our subject matter for today. Well, this is Descartes' dream. I think dream, Descartes' dream would have died if Newton didn't come along a bit later and actually do something which is pretty close to um, realizing Descartes' dream. It wasn't quite right either, of course, but uh, that's a way to look at it. The idea of, of, uh, of laws in, De, in Descartes and, and thinkers at the time that had this idea that laws were, were mathematical principles that describe how God moved things around or Maybe they were something like the things God created that moved things around. So there was this idea of governing and this, the, the metaphor of laws governing really took root and people still speak of that. It also had the idea that laws were part of a systematic, was part of a system, a mathematical system that described how the fundamental things moved around. And so ultimately it would describe how everything moved around since everything is made up out of fundamental. Thing. So there's two ingredients to the concept of, of laws of nature um, from the early on. Oh, uh, this, this slide just has a nice quote that um, some of you may know already from Samuel Clark, who described uh, um, laws as, as God's volitions. So this idea of governing being connected to theology, I think is important to the origin of the conception of laws. And I think one of the philosophical, metaphysical ideas about how to think about laws is really a descendant of that without the theology. But I think it's not uninteresting to think about the theology when thinking about it. So here are the contemporary views regarding laws that have been discussed. I think Jacob had a Ned Hall on, is that right, Jacob, at some point? Uh, to discuss these ideas. And I think he went over the same thing, and many of you know this. But just to get it on the table, in, in, in the contemporary philosophical literature, there are basically two kinds of views about laws that have got to be called Humean and non-Humean. They're called Humean, not because Hume really developed this account of laws. Its explicit development wasn't until much later Maybe Mill suggested something like that. Maybe Ramsey suggested it, but David Lewis uh, gave it the name Humean. And then non humean ideas. The Lewisian idea developed the idea that laws are part of a systematic system. He did it together with a kind of Humean metaphysics in which on Lewis's view, the fundamental properties in the world whatever they might be, maybe they like being char, having charge, or maybe they're um, uh, field values or something like that, they um, are individuated independently of laws. And, what, and the, whole, the whole history throughout all of space time of the instantiation of these properties might be able to be systematized. If they, it can be systematized in a fairly, simple system which meets certain criteria which have evolved over the history of science on what's wanted of a theory of the world, criteria like being highly informative, maybe dividing things, the uh, 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 facts up into initial conditions and dynamical laws, being relatively simple, having exhibiting various, symmetry, various symmetries and so on. These are what the laws, the laws are entailments for such, from such a system. That's the Lewisian idea about laws. That's the Humean account of laws. <clears throat> it rejects the governing metaphor in favor of the systematizing aspect of laws. Non-Humean accounts are a bit different. One version of it, non-Humean account, construe laws as metaphysically fundamental items over and above 
the, fun, the fundamental ontology and fundamental properties and the distribution of fundamental properties that in some way governs it. If I permit myself to tell a quick little story just to warm myself up, I was once giving a talk about this in Berlin, actually. And um, some physicists were at this thing too, giving talks. And for that reason, some important physicists, they sent journalists to it. And I wanted to illustrate these two different kinds of views. So I illustrated with the following story. And I apologize to those people who I see here have heard the story before. Um, that I said, well, look, think of the two views like this. Imagine God wanted to create the universe. On the Luisian Jungian view, what God did is he created a space-time arena and distributed all of the fundamental properties throughout all of the points or regions in the space-time. And then we came along, or scientists came along, trying to find the best systematization of it. That's the least one idea. The other idea, what God did is he just created the initial conditions and created these things called laws and it took the initial conditions and evolved and that created the universe. So this was written up in a newspaper in Berlin, German newspaper. And I don't understand, we read German very well, but I saw my name was mentioned in the article. So I brought the, the newspaper back to Budapest where, where my wife is from. I gave it to her mother to read and she started laughing hysterically. When she was reading the newspaper article, she said, it says here that the next speaker was the theologian, Barry Lower. At least I got one or two people to smile from this story. I still find it very funny. Okay. Anyway, this kind of non human view, but without the theology, is mainly associated with Tim Maudlin now in a sort of sophisticated way. It also is a kind of view well, I, I don't want to associate with Eddie Chan, who's here, and, and Shelley Goldstein, because they don't have the evolution part. They took that out. But they also have a non human view in which the laws in some way govern or constrain the distribution of fundamental properties. A little bit earlier, David Armstrong had a view sort of in this neighborhood. I don't, don't want to necessarily ally them with his view, because his view was pretty clunky. Where he did it. No, we're not going to get into details. You have to take one of my courses or somebody else's courses to get to that. Okay, there's another kind of non human view. In fact, two other kinds of non human views. One sort of is it echoes back to a kind of view about how to think about regularities in the world that Descartes' dream replaced. That's usually associated with Aristotle and it's been revived at various times. A Kant might have held the view a little bit in this neighborhood. I've learned recently from a Kant scholar. Um, this is his non sort of non idealist view. Maybe it's a pre critical view. And anyway, the Aristotelian view is that the fundamental properties are really powers or capacities. And the regularities that obtain in the universe are the product of the activities of these powers or capacities. Among the contemporary philosophers who are known for developing a view like this, it are, um, is Alexander Byrd, other people too. There's yet another way of being non human uh, that's associated with Mark Lang. And what he does is he takes something like, like counterfactuals as being fundamental, really fundamental. And then laws are consequences in a certain way, which I won't go into with the counterfactuals. The main idea is that for humans, What's fundamental is the distribution of fundamental properties throughout a space time arena. And those properties are themselves not individuated by nomological or other kinds of necessary connections if they occur at different locations of space and time. Lewis makes use of this in a lot of ways in his uh, metaphysics, which I, I don't uh, go along with. But I do like his ideas that what makes something a law is its role in a systematization. And that's the idea that I'm gonna develop. Okay, we just talked about these two things. I, I apologize that I didn't think about using these slides earlier until Jacob just mentioned it. Okay, now I don't like non human views or anti human views. I don't like it because this idea of laws governing, I find really obscure. Maybe 
to Descartes, the idea of God moving things around was just natural. So he understood it clearly. Uh, uh, Malbranche clearly had a view like this. Descartes seems to have a view like this in various of his writings in Le Monde and elsewhere. Um, sometimes it's called occasionalism in Malbranche. Uh, the, but I don't, I don't understand what laws could be over and above the ordinary uh, events, so their distribution of fundamental events. And I don't understand how they, what, how they can move things around. They certainly don't cause things to move around. God might have thought to be causing things to move around. But if we think of what causation is, it isn't fundamental. So what's going on here? How do law laws govern? That's why I don't like the governing view in the way that Tim Maudlin has. And there are other features of this view that also I reject. He connects it to a fundamental directionality of time. We probably won't have time to get into that, but I'd, I don't like that either. And so I'd like to get rid of that. Okay, I don't like the Aristotelian view either because I also think it's, obs it's obscure exactly what powers are. And it's really not clear how contemporary fundamental physical laws fit into a kind of powers account. Since what the fundamental laws in, in physics do is they evolve the whole state of the universe at a time or on a Cauchy surface or something like that, or, in, uh, or constrain the distribution of fundamental events. That's very different from an Aristotelian, the distribution of fundamental events. That's very different from an Aristotelian view or a powers view. Um, there have been people who tried to adopt the powers view to more to fit in with, con with contemporary uh, way contemporary physics thinks about laws. Um, so I don't mean to say this is a knock, knock down criticism, not knock down against either view. In fact, these are, the, these are the main views that are on the table. What I'm going to do is to take Lewis's view, criticize it, and then uh, develop a new view. Great. Okay. Not that my view is great. I mean, it's great that it's only 120. That's it's great. Okay. Here's a little slide about Lewis. The way reason I became persuaded of Lewis's view is when I saw that it also had a view about how to think about objective chances. I've been very puzzled about them, as I mentioned earlier. I also, going back to the history, that I don't want to redo this. It's very interesting to me that the notion of chance um, sort of took root around the same time as the, the notion of laws took root, uh, particularly in, you know, it, it's often attributed to Pascal. And in fact, Ian Hacking actually provides, I think, a birth date for the contemporary notion of chance. Now, of course, there are precursors to the idea of laws and the idea of chance that go back before that. I've even read in Maimonides some discussion of what looks like chance with even some sketches of the mathem mathematics of probability. And I know other people in the medieval angels had similar ideas, but it really wasn't so developed. And it didn't start developing with the idea of there being regularities involving chances um, until sometime also in the 18th century. Interestingly, the things that law, the phenomena that laws were applied to and the phenomena that chances were applied to were rather different. Um, laws being applied to, you know, places where mathematical principles could just characterize how the planets move, how the moon moves, how meteors move, how projectiles move on Earth. Um, whereas chances were applied to things like um, uh, agriculture and setting insurance rates and so on. Uh, I've even found people who, who wonder about whether or not the realm of chances and the realm of laws might not overlap at all. They might just apply to different places. But by the 19th century, it became, um, it, 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 people started applying probability in, to physics, especially in statistical mechanics. So I wondered what are chances anyway and how do they fit together with laws? Well, Lewis makes a suggestion about it 
His suggestion is this, and I think it's an incredibly cool idea. I don't know that anybody, well, some other people I know agree, but I don't know how widespread this idea has really taken root. And I don't think, and then I'm gonna say something shocking. I don't think Lewis himself understood his idea well enough. Okay. I say that shocking because for me, Lewis is the greatest philosopher of the 20th century or maybe ever. Okay, so here's what Lewis's idea was in brief outline. Lewis said, well, look, some people around me think that chances are in the world in some way in which laws were supposed to be, you know, among the fundamental things. So for example, Popper seemed thought that chances were something like degrees of propensity. They kind of like push things around themselves, only instead of pushing things around, they just sort of urge things. I don't know how that's supposed to work, but that was Popper's idea in a kind of comic book form. Um, I, I, I'd say it's in comic book form, but I don't think he ever did anything much better than that, or his followers did anything better, much better than that. I'm sure there are people who would disagree, and I'd like to hear about that later. Uh, but Lewis didn't like that idea, and I don't like it either. I don't understand how they're supposed to work. So Lewis said, maybe what chances are, are that in order to help in a systematization, we introduce into our language a, a, a function, a probability function. Maybe it's a two-place probability function. I think it's the right way to think about it. It's not quite how Lewis thought about it, but it's a conditional probability function. And it satisfies certain mathematical rules that we know about from probability, which you all know of. These are the axioms which were developed earlier by Colm McGarrow and earlier than that, even really, the mathematics was developed. Uh, and um, we introduce in our language because it is a way of telling us a lot about the world in a pretty simple form. To make this really, really clear in a really simple illustration, let's see if I have that in the next slide. No, but I'll just say it. Um, it is that just something you have to think in your mind right now. Uh, maybe I'll have a slide later, but I'll, let me just say it. Think about a law that the world consisted of a long H's and T's. Think of them as outcomes of coin flips, except forget about the flipping, forget about the coin. All the world has in is a long sequences of H's and T's. Suppose that there's no simple mathematical expression that we could use to characterize that long sequence of H's and T's. In other words, there's no recursive function which will characterize it. It's what now people will often identify with a random sequence. You still might be able to say a lot about the sequence by saying, well, look, the probability of getting 10 H's, the next 10 H, the next one's being, uh, the, or the next sequence, the next outcome being an H, next one H is one half. And furthermore, the outcomes are independent of each other. This could tell you a lot about the sequence. Of course, it tells you a lot, not by telling you what will happen on the next flip, but it'll tell you a lot by telling you something about what your degrees of belief should be on the next flip or on a long sequence, maybe, you know, on getting what your degrees of belief should be in getting half heads and half tails on the next hundred flips, getting about 50, between let's say 48 and 52 flips on to heads on the next hundred flips. It will tell you that your degree of belief should be about, I didn't do it up in one, but over 0.9, I'm sure. Okay, now in order to do this, you need some principle connecting chances with um, objective probabilities. And Lewis realized this, he introduced this at something famously called the principle principle. Again, we can talk about this in the, in, in the, during the question period. And I think my way of looking at things will provide something like an answer to why the principle principle is there. And Lewis puzzled about what could justify it. And in fact, Lewis realized that his principal principle, the way he introduced it, was actually in somewhat in tension with his particular account of objective uh, chance, 
And so we had to modify it a little bit. Again, we can talk about that during the questions because I don't think the modification is very great. In fact, you don't even need it, I think, when you really understand what's going on here. Um, okay. So uh, when I saw this, I thought Lewis's idea about what laws are and how laws and objective probabilities should be connected to each other is a great, great idea. But there was a problem with the way Lewis introduced it. The problem is that Lewis sort of bought Popper's view a little bit because Popper had his view because of quantum mechanics. People thought that quantum mechanics was, had indeterministic dynamics. Now, I know you've heard from other people and many people here know that that's a gigantic, well, I would say oversimplification, but rather I should say just a gigantic error. Uh, it only comes in in a dynamical way into standard quantum mechanics via the collapse postulate. And uh, again, it's another talk, but I think when you really think it through, you really don't want to develop quantum mechanics with the collapse postulate. Probabilities you want in quantum mechanics, but not that way. So there are indeterministic versions of quantum mechanics. I think most of you here know about the, the Gerardi Remini Weber theory. That's one way it can be introduced. It's not exactly the same thing as standard quantum mechanics, but it's close enough, I think. And that has really has indeterministic dynamics in it. But standard dynamics with the standard Schrodinger equation or the Schrodinger equation and the, the guidance equation in, uh, in uh, versions of Bohmian mechanics, those laws are deterministic. So probabilities must be introduced in some way that's compatible with determinism. But Lewis thought that if you're going to have objective probabilities, you're going to have objective chances, the fundamental dynamic laws have to be indeterministic. This is what I was alluding to when I said, I don't think Lewis himself understood his view about probability. Because when you really understand how he introduced the notion of probability, it doesn't require that the fundamental dynamic laws are deterministic because Probabilities can give a lot of information about the universe, even when the dynamics are deterministic. It gives more information than the, uh, the, the, the dynamical laws do. Because what the dynamical laws do is they take the whole state of the universe, the precise state of the universe, and says how it will evolve. But the probabilities may be able to tell you something about how a partial description of the state of the universe at a time, or it doesn't have to be the state of the universe at a time, just a partial description how it's related to partial descriptions at other times. When I saw this, I thought this was gold for philosophers. I'm not sure everybody who's here, in fact, now that I see who's here, I know that not everybody's gonna agree with this, but for me, that was a big deal. Okay, that's a lot of the background, why I got excited by Lewis's idea. Now, Lewis connected his idea, as I said earlier, with a certain metaphysics about fundamental properties. Two things about his metaphysics. One is he just assumed something about that there was a space time there. But I was aware that there are some people in physics that don't think that the fundamental space time is Euclidean as Lewis seemed to think, of course not. I think his view could be adopted to general relativistic space time, but not quite, it would take some work and I'm not even sure anybody's bothered to work out what you'd have to do. And there are certain views in which in quantum gravity where the fundamental arena isn't space-time either. Space-time is, let's say, like to say, emergent. So I didn't like that. This is the small thing. The other thing I didn't like is, is assuming that the fundamental properties were metaphysically given as perfectly natural properties instantiated at space-time points, and that they were categorical, is the word he used. That means that they're individuated in a way independently of uh, lawful connections to instantiations of properties at other space times. Like I said, he made use of that in other parts of his metaphysics, which I also don't want to follow. Um, now, why did he do this? Well, because he realized that his idea that laws as part of a best systematization of the world was subject to a kind of worry if you didn't fix the language that you're doing this best systematization in. He said this, well, suppose you had a language which had in it a predicate S. And S is a predicate that's true of all and only exact, actually existing objects or actually existing events. Now, Lewis had a particular view about 
notions of actual and possibility in which no events or anyway, no objects could exist in more than one world. This objection could be made even if you didn't have that view. But if on Lewis's view, the worry then is you could introduce as a fundamental axiom, everything is S. And that of course entails all the truths of the world. So this would make all the truths of the world laws. That's ridiculous, we don't want that. And would make this the theory of everything that Steven Weinberg was wanting to find and I guess it hasn't been done yet. Man, that would be pretty easy, right? I don't think anybody's gonna win a Nobel prize for proposing everything is S as, a, as the final theory. So Lewis didn't think that either. So he said, well, what could I do? So you realize you need a special language. He wanted to have these perfectly natural properties for other metaphysical reasons. So he said the language should be the, the language in which the fundamental predicates pick out perfectly natural properties. Um, he didn't have to do that. He could have had some other restriction on the language, but that's what he did because he had other purposes for perfectly natural properties. Okay. Um, good. Um, just so I complete about Lewis, Lewis also made a claim about the actual world. I'm not sure he thought this holds in other possible worlds. Lewis believed that there were all these possible worlds too. Um, I think in some sense there are other possibilities maybe, but not the way Lewis thought about them. Um, but he thought there were these concrete possible worlds and he thought they too were composed of instantiations of these perfectly natural properties instantiated at the space-time points of the arenas in these other worlds. And he thought of the actual world, that it only had one perfectly natural kind of perfectly natural relation. He thought these are geometrical and topological relations. I'm not sure he thought this is so true for other possible worlds or not. Maybe they had other kinds of relations in them too. But the actual he claimed was, this is the view that's something called Jungian supervenience. Jungian supervenience is that all the truths about the world supervene on, or in some sense go grounded by, if I'm allowed to use that term, uh, the distribution of fundamental, perfectly natural properties that are instantiated in the actual world and geometrical relations, because that's the only fundamental uh, natural relation. That was Lewis's view. There are a lot of things that you can object to in his view. I think you see that Tim is here. He brought out, I think, is one of the killer objections to this view. Um, but there are many other objections as well. So I don't think this is very good. And his view doesn't presuppose you mean supervenience. This is the only relation. And I don't think you really need these perfectly natural properties. A another issue about Lewis, I should mention, is that Lewis said that the good making features, the one that's, that makes for the best systematization of the world is the system which best combines simplicity with informativeness, that best balances these two. And his account of informativeness was very crude, I think. I think what he was really gesturing at is whatever the principles are that physics is searching for in a best systematization of the world. And mere informativeness in the sense of excluding possibilities is not really what you want. And you want things like dividing uh, things up between uh, uh, dynamical laws and initial conditions. And there might be laws which also specify initial conditions too. We'll come back to that in a minute. But you, uh, you definitely want this division between dynamical laws and you can understand why because of the role time plays for us and in our world. The main thing is that Lewis's idea is this idea of systematization. That's what I want to take. I do not want to take the humanism of his metaphysics with me, but I do want to take the idea of systematization. Okay, thank you. There's some objections or worries about Lewis's account within the Jungian tradition too. But uh, for example, what if there's not one a unique best systematization? Suppose there are seven and they disagree a little bit about what 
the laws are. What do you do then? Well, Lewis said something about that, but you can worry about that. We can talk about that if you want later. I don't think this is a big worry. And what is a worry is suppose our world doesn't have a best systemization or that the best systemization is so bad that we would never recognize that as something like a best theory. I think then the thing to do is to say Lewis's idea of what laws are just crashes and burns. It's no good. But I think we have good reason to think that our world is not like that. Now we might wonder, why is our world like that? And that's a question you could ask about a Jungian view. My answer to that is longer than I'm gonna tell you right now, but is you gotta stop answering questions sometime. You could invoke God if you wanted to. I don't wanna do that. You could invoke some other metaphysics if you want to. There are people I don't wanna do that, but I don't think any of that does you get you any further. Okay. Now look at Lewis and you look at it and you can say, well, there are some things about it that look pretty good. Let's so get to that. I'm sorry about that. Okay. One is that it connects laws with systems and the epistemological criteria for lawmaking systems. Now the connection is sort of distant, but we can understand why people, when they make proposals, what physicists, when they make proposals for laws, why they want them to fit into a big unifying system. This goes way back to, you know, the Newton for sure, maybe even earlier than Newton a little bit. And, and definitely, you know, Maxwell and, and, and Boltzmann and Einstein and so on. You want a system. Um, and it makes no appeal to governing or mysterious modal connections. I like that too. Logical modality, I think I understood. I've never understood metaphysical modality, to be frank. And that may be more a comment on me and my, you know, rather than on anything else. It explains nomological modality in terms of non-nomological facts and the aims of science. It provides an account of objective physical probabilities that occur in quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. Now, I didn't stop to say this, but let me, say it now, when it came to statistical mechanics, there it was, thought, it was thought, and may still be thought now, that the fundamental dynamical laws are deterministic. So when Boltzmann wondered, what are the probabilities that occur in statistical mechanics? He thought, gee, they must be epistemological. But they weren't merely subjective degrees of belief because he thought these were the right epistemological probabilities. Well, what makes epistemological probabilities the right ones? Well, there is a tradition in statistical mechanics, particularly, if some of you may know the work of E.T. James, he's the person I know who really pursued this vigorously, in which they try to somehow come up with principles of a priori reasoning, which determine what, uh, or a combination of a priori together with facts about the world, which determine what the right epistemological probabilities are. Now, it's again, another talk to argue against these, but I don't like any of these. I don't think any of these work out very well, though I was a fan of James's views at one point in my existence. Um, so it provides an, an account of what the objective probabilities that occur in quantum mechanics and in statistical mechanics are. Um, how it applies to Everettian quantum mechanics is, is a, difficult, obscure, and I know there are people here who've written a bit about that, um, and that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't think this is the kind of account that Lewis does apply in any very obvious direct way there, but as you know, uh, the Everettian account has trouble with probability, and maybe they turn their, their trouble into an advantage, I don't know, but I think it's a big problem there too. Also, one of the ways of making sense of statistical mechanics as a kind of general, as a kind of fundamental theory of the world, together with the dynamical laws, is to connect it via with the past hypothesis, a term that was introduced by David Albert, a claim that it's a cosmological hypothesis about the early universe, which says that the entropy of the universe was very small then, plus some other things. So that would count as a law on this Louisian account. So I thought this was great. Well, there's some worries that people, everybody has about Jungian laws. One is 
But union laws are just, they're just regularities. How do they support counterfactuals? We want laws to support counterfactuals. So that's an objection that some people come up with. Let me answer that one right off. Of course, the main person who developed an account of counterfactuals was David Lewis, but he also held a union account of laws. And when you look at his account of counterfactuals, although he never really says this explicitly, it's quite clear that his account of laws and his account of counterfactuals are completely compatible with each other. It's really the way we evaluate laws that makes it the case that laws support counterfactuals. And a union account of laws can give a motivation for why it is that we're, we're, we hold laws pretty much fixed. Now, in Lewis's particular account, he allows for little miracles. But I think that's a bad part of Lewis's account. And I've developed an account of counterfactuals which gets rid of that and gets rid of similarity also in place of probability. And other people have followed similar ideas too. But again, that's another talk. So, okay, another objection. So I don't think that objection is worth anything. Union laws don't explain their instances since they hold in virtue of the facts they are alleged to explain. Well, this is an objection that's been written about quite a bit. I don't think it's any good either because I don't think union laws explain their instances by governing them. They explain them by unifying them, showing how they're connected to others, other instances, and by supporting counterfactuals. And via supporting it, counterfactuals understood properly uh, uh, being connected to causation. That's their role in explanation, not by making events happen. But now a lot of people still think this is a good objection. Uh, I just mentioned that I brought up a former student of mine, some of you may know, I don't think he could come today, is Thomas Blanchard. He's a philosopher you should know about. He's really good. He's in Germany right now. But he just sent me a paper developing the idea that Jungian law is explained by a unification or that law is in general explained by a unification which I think nails it. Okay, and this is an idea that's around. I've written about this too, and um, uh, 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 other people have, as well, Harjit Bogal has a very nice paper about this. Um, uh, here's an objection that Lewis himself imagined. He calls it rat bag idealism. It's that maybe his account makes laws too idealistic, too much dependent on us. Okay, I don't think this is any good either. And I think I want to talk now for a minute or two about, I better get to my view, <laughs> I've been telling you other things, is uh, that it depends. I think the main objection is that it depends on this positive, per uh, perfectly natural properties. I think that's not at all a good idea. Why don't I think it's a good idea? Well, because Lewis, thinks that metaphysics comes in and tells physics what the fundamental properties of physics gotta be like. That's not a good thing for metaphysics to be doing in my view. Metaphysics should be the handmaiden to physics, not the other way around. What metaphysics should be doing is, is seeing what metaphysics says about the world, what physics says about the world, seeing what questions arise within it, and then trying to come up with answers compatible with physics. That, that fit in with that. And then maybe ultimately saying that there's certain presuppositions that physics relies on and try to spell them out. So Lewis has a bunch of conditions on perfectly natural properties. Here's a list of them. I'm not gonna stop and talk about them because I mentioned most of them already. I think we don't want them. We want physics to tell us what the fundamental properties are like. That's just what I just now said. Okay, so my idea of developing a count of laws is rather, uh, let me just say one objection to this, the way it was developed by Bas von Frassen in the past. Other people have somewhat similar problems. He, he, von Frassen called this, or actually he didn't name it this, but uh, Heather Demarest he gave it this name. He called it, uh, the mis she called it the mismatch problem. She said, look, if you had the language of perfectly natural properties and you had the best systemization of it, you may come up with something that are the laws according to the best systemization of that, right? of those fundamental properties, instantiates of fundamental properties. But 
if you follow what physics comes up with, then can they come up with the best systematization that satisfies the criteria of science? And its fundamental properties might not be the ones that Lewis calls, that metaphysics calls the perfectly natural properties. This is the worry that, that um, uh, uh, von Frassen came up with. And although it's gonna take away a minute from my talk, when I remember I mentioned this, I, I can't help but bring up that I actually had a conversation with Lewis like two weeks before he died about this. He came up with what might be a response to it, but he wasn't sure. And I had an opportunity to continue this discussion on a train back from Syracuse. And I just was too shy to go sit next to him and talk about it. But I can't tell you, I you know, pretty much regret this in my philosophical life is the, the one thing I missed out on. I wish we had this discussion. Well, there are other people who've come up with nearby problems, related problems uh, uh, about this. Um, Lewis thought it, his worry, his thing was that maybe this couldn't happen for some other features of his metaphysics. We can go about that. Okay. So I came, up, I came up with a different way of developing the idea of it more systematized. I see I have just five minutes to give it but it won't take more than that, really. My idea is this. What we're given are macroscopic properties. They're given to us because of where, how we're constituted as cognitive agents in the world. Now, once we develop a theory about the world based on this as being given, I think we can come up with a good argument that any cognitive agent well, we'll pretty much come up with the same basic properties of the world, ultimately. Uh, Carlo Rovelli has a, a, a kind of line of argument that goes along these lines. We'll let him actually develop it. But that's the idea. We start with macroscopic properties. They're not metaphysically fundamental, but they're the beginning point in developing an account of what the fundamental laws are. That's the central idea of my, 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 my account. What we want to do is to systematize macroscopic properties. What are they? Well, if you look at thermodynamics, they give you a good initial account of them as long as you, you add to thermodynamics uh, average density in small regions, spaces, and time, average energy, you know, say temperature. Uh, average kinetic energy and say temperature, other energy, uh, average frequency of light, and so on. If we knew all of them going on in, the, in your room or in the world, and you had imagine this on a TV screen, you could probably figure out pretty much everything going on in your room macroscopically at any rate. So that's where you sort of start. But we want to systematize them. Now, in order to systematize how they move around, discovery, we needed to introduce more. You need to introduce things like particles or ultimately fields, quantum mechanical wave functions, stuff like, and so on. So the idea is that we start with that language. You want to systematize that. We add to that language in order to systematize more other fundamental function terms and predicates like those in, in, in atomic theory and chemical theory and, and, and so on until we come to something where we, the, we take the laws of them and plus maybe some other principles we introduce as laws, like the principles of statistical mechanics, the probability distribution of statistical mechanics. And they come up with the best, on the best balance, the best systematization of our world. We'll have to be systematizing not just what we started with, but also what we introduced along the way. Of course, I, one of the requirements that I want to add is that whatever we introduce, whatever the truths of our the whatever the reasons in our theories, better be true. But what's saying that they have to be true adds to all of this is a big puzzle to me. I don't know exactly, you know, we use the notion of truth all the time. I don't want to be a irrealist about all of this. I don't want to be a, anything like a verification. It's not a verification view about truth. But I am puzzled about exactly what's saying that these are true is adding. I do want to get away from the idea, though, that there's a God-given world that's there. And it already comes structured in a particular way. And that's what we're systematizing. Rather, my idea is this. 
What there is is there is a world given there, it could be given by God, or or and I don't care, it's not, not be given by anybody, but there is, and it has many, many possible structures, many structures, all of which we could find out and discover. But some of these structures, or maybe a unique one, is scientifically the best structure. And it's what we're aiming to find in fundamental physics and in science more generally, because we want all the sciences to fit together. We want it all to be unified, in my view. So I'm almost at the end. I think I've explained my idea. That's what the package deal, that's why I'm calling it a package deal. Because for it, what counts as a fundamental property, unlike Lewis, where the, fun, where the fundamental properties are metaphysically given, for me, the fundamental properties are given by science or the process of science or the end of the ideal end of science. But what counts as a fundamental property is um, what is said to be fundamental properties by the best of civilization. Now, there's no guarantee that it's going to be unique. What counts as fundamental property might not be unique, but I think that reflects what goes on in physics too, because there are different ways of formulating fundamental physical theories that while they might in some way be equivalent, not just empirically equivalent, but even equivalent about what they say the laws are, they're not equivalent about what they say are fundamental. I'm not sure what counts as a really good example of that. Maybe some of you can give me, but what I've used in this, you know, different formulations of classical mechanics, because it's not the right theory, but you can formulate it in, you know, using Hamilton's equations or Lagrange's equations or, or, or Newton's laws, and they take different things as being fundamental. I think you can do the same thing with quantum mechanics in various ways. Um, different ways of formulating Bohmian mechanics that, that in some ways we strike us as not being just empirically equivalent, they're being equivalent in a more fundamental way, but they're not equivalent about what properties are fundamental. So I think that what counts as fundamental might not be something that itself is metaphysically is unique. That's very, very different from this the world comes with a pre-structured, correct way in which it's built up metaphysical view. The philosopher that I know who rejected this view, and sometimes I've been told that my view has echoes of the man. I say it quickly because I know I don't, while well, I think I was very much influenced by him because I am as a teacher, but I do not want to buy a lot of his views. I, I, you know, if you were a class, I would ask, who is that? But since you're not, I will say it's Hillary Putnam. Did anybody else feel that as I was talking? If, shake your head if you did. No, maybe you're not on the same page as me. But Putnam made this big deal of saying that the world does not come with a God-given structure. So that's the view that I'm rejecting. But I do think that physics finds a structure that's in the world. But what makes it the fundamental structure is because that's one of the structures that physics will find. And what makes it the laws, that's one of the structures that physics will find. And what makes this at the right space time is also that's something that's going to be found within in physics. Okay, so this view that I just, I'm just about done really. Let me see if I can just come to an end very easily if I can get to the right slide. I, my arrow is having a lot of trouble moving around. Okay, well, you can see that I don't suffer, my view doesn't suffer from Lewis's view of his S predicate. Everybody sees that right off. I don't think that's a problem. There are something that might play a role of natural properties within my package deal account, but they're not natural properties because they're given by the metaphysics, they're natural properties because they come out of physics and physics. Is this view compatible with Humeanism? Well, it could be if the fundamental properties as deemed by physics are all categorical, but that might not be. Physics might want to uh, uh, individuate properties so that certain field properties are what they are because of their nomological connections with other field properties. That's okay with this view. So this view is not really Humean as sometimes people think Humeanism view. It's compatible with Non, you mean dispositionalism too, but not with a powers view because laws are not laws because they're the product of the activity of powers. They're laws because they're part of the best systematization. Okay, I'm gonna end with this now. What about rat bag idealism? Okay, this is what Lewis, this is a quote from, 
from Lewis. Maybe I just hold my breath while you let you read it. Okay, assuming you're fast readers, the problem may look even worse for the package deal account because I've now made what counts as fundamental properties part of the package. But I don't think it is worse. I don't think this is a problem at all because in this view, there is an objective world. What comes from us, so to speak, but not just from me or you. It's not like I could, you know, I mean, if I'm falling out of a building, I can't say, gee, I wanna change the law of gravity so I don't splatter on the ground. I can't do that. So it's not idealist in that way. And in fact, all of scientists together cannot call the convention and say, we reject the laws of gravity. They can't do that because what the laws are beholden to are principles that come out of the history of physics, not out of the opinions of physicists or desires of physicists. It's not idealist in that way. It, 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 what counts as laws does depend on a cultural phenomena, the development of physics. And there could be a culture which never develops such a thing. But I don't think that's an objection. Uh, to it. It doesn't make laws any less object objective. Okay, I think this is even, com this is compatible with certainly with what's sometimes called scientific realism. Okay, it's certainly compatible with saying that um, electrons and uh, other hidden things exist. What it's not compatible with is that whether they're fundamental or not is being completely independent of the practice of science. Okay, so uh, so I sort of answered Hacking's question. What breathes fire into the equations is the history of and the practice of doing physics and science more generally. We didn't talk about special science laws, but if we did, I would give my view about how that's connected to the laws of physics. So. I think Hawking, when he asked this question, I don't know what he had in mind, really. Uh, I did see Hawking. I was about two feet from him once in my life, but I didn't get to ask him any questions, needless to say. Um, but I would have asked him if I could, not possible anymore. Um, but he made it sound as though it's something like God or something big. Or anyway, he raised so many questions. But my view sort of deflates it a little bit. But I explain what my view is, and, and that's what this book that I've written is about. So thanks, thanks a lot. That's the end. I finished in an hour. Maybe that was a little Thank bit. you. That was amazing. Great. Good. Good. All right, everybody. Okay, I have a hand from Steve. Steve, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, Barry. That was I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I think I'm very sympathetic to most of your your views. Um, I wanted to ask. I, I you may have sort of answered this a little bit, but I wanted to ask it anyway. Um, uh, my question is sort of whether uh, you see the best systems account um, and you know your your package deal um, version of it as. Um, sort of a, as a, something normative or something purely descriptive. And the reason I ask that is that um, it, it seems to me that in Lewis and in sort of a Lewisian tradition, there's a lot of effort put into um, uh, sort of coming up with a single best systems account way of, you know, given a Humean mosaic, reading off what the laws are, um, you know, what statements count as laws in some sort of objective way that everyone will agree on. And that has always seemed kind of strange to me. Um, it seems to me that if, that once you have a human mosaic given, right, you have all the facts about the world, what you call laws at that point, you know, seems more like maybe a matter of convention or a matter of pragmatism, psychology. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering if you see you know, the sort of best systems account laws as something saying something about um, about the practice of science, uh, you know, something anthropological, 
or um, if you see it as doing something more than that, or perhaps being some sort of normative, uh, uh, something to do with practice of, of science, but in a normative sense in guiding how science should be done. Well, although that's a really good and important question for what I'm interested in, um, for you know, straying a bit out of things I think I think I know something about. Um, I don't see a sharp distinction between the normative and the descriptive, and I would like to really have a good account of how to think about that. People, some people have accounts, but I've never found anything that made me happy. But it's because I haven't maybe I haven't looked enough. So I don't quite, you know, sort of agree with the way you formulated things. On the other hand, the way you talked about Lewis, I'm completely with you um, about Lewis in that the way he thinks about uh, laws, you know, once you have these metaphysics, that's it, that's the world. And now somebody could say, you know, I'm gonna call these things laws, I'm gonna call those things laws. And then you need a reason, well, well why call these? And maybe there's some objective reasons because these are better for, for one thing you want to do and these are better for something else, as you're saying, pragmatic. Um, and more generally about Lewis, I, I, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about Lewis because I know you're writing some big thing about Lewis, is that um, he's, he, okay, I'll, I'll now say it so if I get some response from people. I think of Lewis uh, from the little bit of Greek philosophy I remember. Remember the Phaedrus, where the charioteer is being driven by two horses? That's what I think what Lewis is like, except he maybe has three horses, and they all want to go in different directions. One horse is science. Another horse is common sense. And then he tries to bring them together, not going to work. And then he tries to bring another one, and that is, you know, philosophy around him. And they're, they're not going to go in the same place. I want to let go of two of those horses, basically. Okay, is that sort of, you see how that fits in with your, your question, I hope. I think so, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, um, for instance, like you have von Frossen saying there are no laws, which seems to me just to be a, a very, uh, you know, intentionally controversial way of saying that, you know, laws are, are what we call laws, even a human mosaic is a matter of convention, right? Right. And Cartwright says there are no laws, and she is a very different. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the things I didn't get to say, but I like to say this, is that there's it is that the statement that if there's no God, there's no laws. That's believed both by John Foster, who had an interesting book. He's a believer in God. It's also believed by Nancy Cartwright. <laughs> the reason there are no laws is there's no God. The reason is von Frossen. I didn't quite realize I could have added von Frossen. He had, has other reasons to think that there are no laws. So, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. The next hand I have is Noah. Hi, Noah. Hi. Hi, Barry. It was very nice to hear this very succinct overview of your position. Um, I want to just ask you about this universe of a long string of H's and T's. Um, you say we learn a lot about it by being told that the, the, the probability of T's is um, 0.5. I was just wondering if you would say we learn a little bit more. So let's say the, if you look at the relative frequency over the billion or so, and you find that um, the, there are slightly more T's than H's, would you say we learn a little bit more about this universe by being told the probabilities of H's is um, whatever it is, 0. 0.500001. Or would you say actually 0.5 equiprobability is something simpler than, than any other probability. Therefore, I think. best systematization gives you 0. 0.5. Yeah, I at first misunderstood what you had in mind, but I understand better now. So, but just first to make it clear to everybody, it's really not what you've seen up till now. It's the whole history of the facts in the world. And of course, it's not H's and T's. That was just an illustration. So it's it's all of the the you know what happens when a certain uh, I don't know what is when I there's really conditional probabilities that I think are important for statistical mechanics, for example. Now how 
uh, uh, um, if, you, if you drop some ink in, of a certain size and water at a certain temperature, blah, 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 conditional on this, how likely is it that it, in the next five minutes it takes such and such a path? Well, there'll be a frequency of many, many things and what you want to do is systematize all of that. Okay, so I agree with, though I think you know what you're really worrying is how to balance simplicity against informativeness. I think that simplicity and things related to simplicity are gonna play a very important role. So if in fact the frequency of actual heads and tails in the world we're talking about is 0.5007232626, then you might say, well, the real chance is 0.5, but you can get a small deviation from that because that's the way chances are. But that's how we think about chances or probability, objective probabilities. It would be more informative, but much less simple. And, and would also fail to satisfy other things that we want of scientific chances. And in a world like ours, I don't think there's any big danger of this because there's so, it's our world is so many facts and, and the basic theories we're gonna look at are relatively simple that the idea that you could somehow complicate our world a bit and get more, get, make it more informative is I think very, very dim. That is a kind of objection, particularly to the non-chance version of Lewis's view that by adding a few more regularities, you can get a more informative world by a slight complication. This is an example that John Roberts, for example, pursues, even though he's sort of a union, but I don't think it's a very good objection. I don't know if that's what you had in mind. We can, we can talk about this because you've been suffering through a much longer version of this. I know, and it'll come up. <laughs> well, that's a different kind of an experience but I so I misunderstood what you've said is very interesting because I wasn't thinking of this as an actual sequence embedded in the real world I thought you had in mind a sort of toy example of that a universe entirely of this string um, that was supposed to be the whole world that was just to get yeah, you food I, to understand what I think chance is doing in in fundamental physics and furthermore I think when you really think it through and here I disagree with, oh, Carl is still here. I disagree with Carl. I think that all the chances got to somehow come from, from this, but it, it is definitely a real argument that one can engage in whether you could believe this or not. Well, I would like to ask you some more about the toy examples, but I better um, wait until see, see if there's any time left over at the end. Sure. Thanks, Noah. The next hand I have is Carl. Uh, okay, well, I don't want to ask you about chance, Barry, but I wanted to press you on to, to clarify to what extent you want to uh, have this deference to physics. So you, you talked about Lewis being pulled in three directions by three horses, and you've gotten rid of two of them, and the one you're keeping is physics, but, um, but you're, you're still kind of imposing a view about what physics should come up with that may not be what physicists in the end decide to do. So what if, what if, um, for example, physicists started becoming more and more persuaded by Nancy Cartwright and, uh, and some other people that talk about capacities and powers. And in the end, physicists sort of decide to throw up their hands looking for fundamental equations that, that govern every uh, event and instead say, well, really the, the right physics uh, is a list of powers and how they combine and interact with each other. Um, would that be still consistent with your system? So as a matter of you know, possibilities, that could happen. And that would be sort of like, from my point of view, like what would happen, uh, let's see, what's a really good example for me? Um, I can't think of a really good, the only examples I think of are, are bad for me, my point of view, so I'm not gonna give any of them. <laughs> but let me just give a straightforward answer. So what I think is this, I have now identified physics with a certain project. I think it's the project that physics started with, around with Descartes and Newton has carried through. Nancy Cartwright thinks that there's another project. That's the project is finding a, a lot of interesting regularities that maybe are Keteris Paribus regularities about our world. 
I think that's a good project too, but she thinks that that project doesn't depend on it anyway. And actually, she th actually goes further and says you should give up on what I'm identifying as a project in Newton and so on. I disagree with that. I don't think there's any reason to give, it, to give up on it. I think if you look at the history, you want to go in the opposite direction. And exactly how her project will really go, she's been the one who's developed it a bit, but exactly how these Keterus Parabus regularities fit together with each other, she says conflicting things about that. Maybe that's appropriate because the Keterus Parabus regularities might conflict, but um, I don't see what to do then. So I would say that if, if physics went her way, she's a persuasive person. As again, just my, my, my own self. I sat next to her, Eddie isn't here anymore, I think, but he sat me next to her at a dinner about a year and a half ago. And I was petrified because she's a formidable, you had her as a teacher, right, Carl? I, I didn't, but I, I was petrified that she, and the worst would be is she'd try to convince me, but she was just like incredibly nice person. <laughs> then we got a little fine. So, but she's a very good writer. And, and I think she's pretty persuasive in her books about this, a book about this, a couple of books about it. But I just don't think that when you really think it through, it really is persuasive. It's rhetorically persuasive. But like I said, this is something that could be, I think it's still on the table to be argued about, but I'm willing to take one side of this argument. So it went her way, I would say, it's no longer what I called physics. Now call it Cartwrightian physics. So there are many areas in philosophy where people get caught between, is there consciousness or not? No, there's not consciousness because my conception of consciousness is that it's not physical, okay? And, and all there is is physics, so there's no consciousness. So-called illusionists seem to say something like this. But in that case, I think they're nuts, okay? In this case, I don't think it would be crazy to say, well, it's not physics, is it? Not physics as I understood it. Thanks, that, that, that's good. Thanks, Carl. So we have a question in the chat, uh, and then I also see Siddharth will be next after the question in the chat. Um, so the question in the chat is, uh, in the case of non-Humean powers, would it collapse into the same problems as a Humean account where all true statements are laws, or can this be avoided by having powers that are only theoretical and never actualized? And in that case, do there have to be powers that are real but non-actual? So my understanding, I'm not, I find the powers view so distasteful that I think I will say bad, false things about it. But um, I believe that the people who hold powers views think that the only powers that are actually are actual instead are actually instantiated. So they're different from what was suggested. But I don't see a danger of all truths turning out to be laws for two reasons. One is even if all properties are powers, it still might be that the way they're instantiated, you know, just imagine different initial conditions with powers and then they make for different truths. So I don't see that that's a danger. And I don't think it's a danger for humanism either for the, because you could answer it the way Lewis answered it, or you could just take the part of humanism that I like, that's the systematizing part, and restrict the language in some other way. And basically what I did is to restrict the language in a different way, in a way that's closer to, it, to what I think is the practice of physics. So I don't see, maybe I'm not quite heating, hitting the question. But it's not in my chat, so I don't see it. All right. Well, we can come back to that if the person who asked it would like to uh, would like to ask a follow up. Uh, in the meantime, um, let me hand things over to Siddharth. Um, thank you. Just, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm a bit confused about this idea that you mentioned at the end, which was that even though your idea of that the, the idea that you mentioned is that your uh, this notion of systematization is actually compatible with at least the possibility of a kind of non-Humean structure in the fundamental laws. So mm -hmm. is the idea there that it's at least open to us that there's some kind of natural necessity in the world or 
that's not arrived at via systematization? And if so, wouldn't that sort of lose some of the uh, initial motivation for your account, which is that we don't want to have any sort of mysterious metaphysics? So uh, yeah, I'm curious how you think those are compatible. Thank you. That's it. So, so if you're confused by it, I am too. To be really frank, even though I'm Barry, the, I, I think this is the most puzzling part of the view that I'm trying to develop. I don't see that the view that I'm developing has committed itself to the fundamental properties, not having necessary connections to other fundamental properties. I do see that this is not where the laws come from. It's rather the fact that they have necessary connections to each other comes from the package deal, which brings the laws and the properties together. Um, I'm very puzzled by the whole distinction between properties being individuated by not having necessary connections to each other, that so-called categorical properties, or being individuated in terms of their necessary connections, maybe nomological connections towards each other. That could fit in with my, the way I was developing my view. And there are mixed views. I didn't talk about a view which I should have, which is called super unionism. I won't talk about it now because nobody's asked about it, but that's Michael S. Fell's view, which is the kind of, we, we, uh, anyway, we'll just decide. But someone could have a mixed view. Okay. The view depends on making a clear distinction between categorical and non-categorical properties. It's very natural for a metaphysician to think there is such a distinction because metaphysicians think they understand necessary connections well. Um, even though I sometimes have to teach the metaphysics course, I'm not a metaphysician. I don't really understand that very well. And I'm wondering whether the fact that we think that the fundamental properties have to be either categorical or have necessary connections, you call it dispositional, but I'm not sure you want to call the properties that I'm characterizing as dispositional because they might not really be dispositions. I'm not sure that this distinction is one that doesn't just come from the way our language sort of leads us to make up such a thing. But I haven't thought of a good way of developing that response. I would love to figure that out. So I'm not brave enough to really write that down right now, but that's the idea that's in the back of my mind, to, not, to be neither. And, and the thing I would say about my view is it doesn't commit itself to whether the fundamental properties are one way or the other. It leaves it up to physics to make a decision. And so far as I could see, physics could go in any case, one way or the other way. And in fact, different physics might say, there's no fact in that, or just different views and don't care whether it's dispositional or, or categorical. That would be a way of saying it's, it ain't real. That makes sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, so I guess, yeah, so the thing that is a little bit Puzzling to me was that is the, is the systematization sort of going to reach back down into the ground floor and sort of install some necessity there, right? That wasn't, you know, uh, which seems a bit puzzling because either it's there or it isn't. But perhaps well, the, all know, the necessities are there, and they're not there. Both are there. You get rid of this picture that there's a pre-given correct structure, which is the fundamental structure. What there is is all the structures and science picks out the fundamental structure for our world. So the metaphysical presupposition of physics is that there are all these structures there on my view. What the structure of our world is, is given by physics. And there might be more than one that will count. And, th and there'll be enough, no further thing to say about which is the right one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll think about that. If you can send me an email making sense of this, I would, or your response, I'd be interested. Thank you. Yeah. Carl, I, I saw you had a comment in the chat. Do you want to um, do you want to discuss it in on audio? Carl, can you hear me? I think I froze for a second. Yeah, I, please I, go I ahead. froze for a second. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, did you want to discuss your your comment? Uh, no, no, no. It okay. was just I thought I uh, clarificatory. I thought. Um, so, no, I think you mentioned you had a, a follow-up question that you wanted to go to the end of the line on. Do you still want to ask? Sure, if there's nobody else with a hand up. Um, 
so um so Barry, imagine you've got this you're visiting a friend in a um a computer lab, and she shows you this long string of um things she's printed out, and they're all these grids, eight by eight, with some of the squares filled in black and others just plain white. And um she tells you that this is Conway's game of life, one iteration of it. One of them is the initial conditions, and then she ran it. And so I'm wondering whether you would say, I simply don't understand what you're talking about when you say there was a program that generated these things. Show me the thousand or so sheets and I will systematize it and come to an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that? That's the first part of the question. Would I say, would I say to do it? I think it'd be a great thing to do, I guess. Um, but what do I know about it? I know it's, what, what do I know about this, these, these grids? These, these blacks and white uh, squares. Well, she then she tells you that she's run it with a computer program, which is designed to um, reproduce Conway's game of life. So it's been produced. I, and I, the truth is, I, I think I know what Conway's game of life is, but I maybe have a misunderstanding. There isn't a random element in it, is that right? Right. Yeah. So there is some program that's been followed. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, if there is a program that's been followed for this, then that's the law that describes how this thing was produced. And that would be a good thing to discover. Now, this is but not you the whole world. This is a teeny part of the world, right? Well, yes, let's say this is part of the world. But supposing yeah, she- I think the laws will, and one of the things that the laws will do is it will entail, given the initial conditions of this, what this program is. But you would you would say that you understand the rules of the program as being something that um, she came up with, and she can generate many other universities using the same program. Yeah. So that's, to my mind, is a way of understanding what generative laws are about. And I wonder why you you say that you just simply don't understand generative laws as a way of understanding the universe. Oh, I understand what it is for a computer program to generate okay. so, outcomes. So Tell basically, what it is for so the laws. stumbling block is- Do you think the universe, are you one of those like Dave Chalmers who thinks we're all in a simulation? No, so I'm just wondering whether the problem for you is that we can understand the mechanism in the case of the computer, but we mm -hmm. don't understand it in the case of the universe. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So you understand the idea of a generative universe. It's just, you can't, really believe that a whole universe could be generated. Let me say things a little bit more carefully. I was not claiming that there's anything incoherent or even for that matter, anything theological about a view like Maudlin's view. Uh, that was in the background, but I didn't go into why I wanted to bring that in the background, but that's not the time for this now. But I do think the view is completely coherent, but I wanted to have another view because a lot of philosophy is no philosophy is never totally, you know, one view wins and the others have to pack up and go home. It's rather to develop views as well as you can to see where you can answer other objections. An objection I would make to the generative view is don't think you've understood what generative is because you have this analogy with a computer program. Because here you have these things which are not physical entities. A computer program or its implementation of a computer is physical. We understand the causal mechanism in which it produces the sequences, the ones and zeros. But laws are not physical entities in the world. And don't I don't have no idea. Do you, do you know? Do you know how it generates? If you, if you were a non-Numian, which I don't know you are, but do you, you have any idea how a non-Numian law generates anything? Well, I just think of this as a, a basic principle, as you say, every one has to stop somewhere with a um, series of, well, with, with some unexplained explainers. And it seems to me as if it's perfectly intelligible that this could be one way the universe, our universe is. Well, I agree and with the so, part. I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying it's, there's an inconsistency, I know there's a logical inconsistency, but it's not but basically you're, intelligible. Your, your objection to this view is simply that you find it hard to um, to grasp. It's not that you, you want to stop. Let's, 
that's one objection. My base, best object, objection is I have a better view. Yes, yeah, so you don't really want to get into any of the merits of this view and start weighing them because the I overriding- do, I, do. I very much do. One of its features, for example, the way Maudlin pursues it is it needs a fundamental directionality to time. At first that looks good, but I think you can get the directionality of time. Okay, so yes. A view about probability that fits in with the view about probability I was giving you out of statistical mechanics. And when you have two of these, you wonder, how can you have two of these together? What if they go in opposite directions? What is this arrow doing? Okay, and you end up, I think, saying things that I don't think are very good. Uh, Tim would disagree with me about that, but um, you know, that's, it is a battle. And there are many, so like many things, there are, you know, you can, it's, it's a war. That's not, not just a good. battle, it's a war. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. Noah. Um, the next question I have is from you all. all right, wonderful. Thank you so much for, uh, for such a rich talk. Um, I had a question about, uh, uh, about principles and whether or not uh, some of the principles that we use um, to systematize um, in our best theory, physical theory of the world, uh, whether or not those principles um, are at their root metaphysical or, um, or as you kind of mentioned, you said you didn't have a problem with, uh, um, with logical modality. So whether or not those are logical. So I'm thinking of something like, uh, like uh, the principle of equality of cause and effect or the um, principle of the equipollence of cause and effect. Um, and- What was the last one? Sorry, the, the principle of the equality of cause and effect or, the, um, or sometimes called the, the principle of equipollence of cause and effect. So Maybe this you have to explain what you mean exactly by that, but go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I'm just thinking of the, the principle of the equality of cause and effect. So the idea that the, the cause is always, is, is always equal to the effect. Right. And so, um, so I'm thinking of this because, uh, figures like Leibniz, for instance, um, in the, der in his derivation of say, uh, this viva, right. Uh, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess now what we tend to call kinetic energy, right. Um, uses that principle um, that the cause is always equal to the effect. Um, and that derivation is the first sort of, uh, is the first um, uh, kind of example that we have of, of, of modern conservation laws, right? So um, now, of course, one might say, well, the principle that cause is always equal to the effect, um, it does something really important, right? It allows us to move from, uh, from you know, from the, from the physical world, um, from talking about, you know, things causing other things and uh, phenomena arising from other phenomena. Um, and then now we can, uh, we can sort of um, use mathematical methods to, um, to create models of the world and even to create models that allow us to predict, right? Um, so one might say we're right at the basis of, of modern um, physics, right? You've got a metaphysical principle at work. Um, and it's not clear. Uh, it's not clear to me uh, how we would think of something like the principle of quality, cause, and effect as as um, um, as something that's uh, not a metaphysical principle. Um, I suppose the 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 best case is to say something like, "Well, it's an early instance of uh, of of symmetry, right?" And then one might say, "Well, we handle that with the." Um, uh, with the work of Noter and and others, right? Um, but I'm still not clear on that. So, I, so I was wondering what you would say about principles like that, like the like uh, the equality of cause and effect. Whether you would, I mean, does that uh, does that pose a problem for your view? If one says, well, it's very principles any at all. I appreciate the question. That's interesting to me as a historical question. First of all, I just wanted to say thanks for calling my talk rich, but I assure you it hasn't resulted in me being rich. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> More seriously, I, I think, I don't know really what the principle of cause and effect, what really satisfies it. You know, yeah. I, like many other people here, the effect of being sick in bed and have feeling like you can't breathe was caused by some virus. Are they equal? I, I have no idea. Is that a principle of the equality of cause and effect? I have no idea if that's an instance of 
uh, you know, getting COVID is, is an instance of that or not. So I, I think the principle is so vague. Um, so that's that particular principle. But you introduced another principle from Leibniz. And it's certainly right that ideas from metaphysics have paid off in the history of physics. They paid off in two ways. They sometimes led to really interesting ideas that look like they might actually stick around, like conservation of energy. It might not, that people have called it even into question, even though that one might be really here to say. But there are other things that come from metaphysics, like that the fundamental physics of geometrical structure, geometry is Euclidean, or that time is fundamental, so fundamentally different from space that there are different dimensions. Those come from metaphysics too, I think, in some way, but they didn't pay off, they led to the wrong thing. So the fact that some ideas that came up in the history of metaphysics might prove to be fruitful in developing those ideas, that seems cool and great. I mean, after all, you know, I've had good ideas if, you know, I remember having a great idea after going to a Jimi Hendrix concert once, but I wouldn't <laughs> blame him for anything that I wrote my philosophy paper. So, so you know, very various causes. So, so I don't see this as any problem for my specific view. And I don't know whether you wanted something stronger about the relationship between metaphysics and physics than the way I'm, I'm making it, which is just a, a historical thing that some, there's a tradition of doing metaphysics done in a particular way. And it was done by people who didn't separate doing physics from doing metaphysics, in fact. Leibniz probably wouldn't have recognized the difference between the two, pro, two projects who's in the beginning. Um, so, so I'm not sure whether there's any real issue here, but maybe you can say something more. Uh, well, my, my, my worry, well maybe, well, maybe not so much worry, but my real question is this, in, in talking, well, I, I asked my real question, but um, what, uh, what I'm thinking is that uh, Leibniz, yes, didn't see a difference, right? But he thought that, um, that say, mathematical physics was, of course, the, the way to go, right? Um, but the problem you've got is that in mathematical physics, um, we're, of course, using, you know, uh, mathematical me methods to reason about the, the physical world. Um, and we have to assume uh, the cause is equal to the effect. Um, otherwise, uh, equations don't um, do not do the work of telling us, um, you know, about the world. So there yeah, seems to be... Where does cause occur in any equation? Well... I suppose that's that's a question about the nature of cause, I guess, right? Um, uh, but but the thought is that if if cause isn't equal to effect, because I think the the idea certainly of uh, the the view of uh, many early moderns is that if we're not talking about cause, how are we talking about the physical world, right? Because there's phenomena bring about other phenomena, and that's what we want to that's what we want to describe. I'm so with you about that. I'm going to agree with that. Right, um, and. And then there are certain regularities, certain phenomena bring about other phenomena in a regular way, right? So they're going to be there. So we might say there are causes and then there are effects because these are maybe temporally ordered, right? Um, and in order to uh, in order to describe how this happens and systematize it, right? Then we have to be modeling um, cause and effect, right? Um, so if I've got, if I'm uh, looking at interaction, like, a, you know, uh, if I'm thinking of kinematics or something, um, there's a particle and hits another particle, um, the second particle veers off, right? Um, and there's going to be a, there's going to be a determinable quantity, right, of, of like a energy or, or velocity that the second one's going to have. Um, and surely, uh, whatever brings that about, right? Suppose we say that there's, uh, you know, the, the, the force or something, right, in the, in the second, in the first one that, you know, causes the um, the second body to to move off. Uh, there can't be more force in the in the um, in the moving body that the veers off than there is in the first one, right? Otherwise, then we wonder, well, uh, maybe there must have been some other um, so some other effect, right? Other than the um, than the first particle that we're calling um, a cause. So it seemed like they've got to be um, they've got to be equal, right? So if they're you not, they must be. Do you really mean like there's some necessity to beyond the laws that people think they hold for the universe? I mean, so for example, 
if the fundamental laws were really indeterministic, it sounds like they would violate this. So are you ruling out indeterministic fundamental laws? Well, I think their their worry was that if you don't have something like this, you get um, you get you know things like perpetual motion, right? Because there's because then why can't there be you know energy coming in from somewhere else that uh, um, that's unaccounted for, right? Um, but as soon as that happens, and our system blows up, right? Uh, that was that was the their chief concern, right? Um, so, so there has to be some equality of cause and effect. Otherwise, I think there are a lot of presuppositions in what you're saying. Yeah. You and I, we, I don't share with you. Not that there necessarily is any really deep research. Mm -hmm. And I think this might be a much longer conversation, but I'd be really happy to carry it on by email. I'm just not sure where it could go that's very fruitful at this point. Yeah. I, uh, but I, and basically to what you said though, um, while I do think that there are metaphysical presuppositions that physics couldn't work, if there weren't certain more fundamental than physical facts about the world. So you gotta say, here's what physics for it to work out depends on. Uh, I think that that's right. But I don't think that the one you gave as an example is one of them. I just, I just don't see it. And I think this would be a longer discussion. I think the world it could turn out that the, as I'm understanding this law of equality of cause and effect, you might turn out that we discover tomorrow just doesn't hold and the best systemization of our world violates it. Hmm. So we, we can have a longer discussion if, if you'd like, I'd like. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks, you all. Um, Christopher, I have you next. And then Logan, you'll be next. Great, thank you. Um, hi, Barry, can you hear me all right? I can. Great, thanks. Um, so I, I, you touched on this a bit uh, toward the end of the talk, but I, I just wanted to ask, right? So, so for Lewis, um, the point of systematizing um, I know you disagree about what's getting systematized, right? He has the mosaic right. of perfectly natural properties. Um, but but also the point of systematizing for Lewis is right to come up with like roughly the, the most efficient summary of that mosaic. Right. And I wondered essentially to what extent you agree or disagree with that. I know you want to develop well, a I list of standards. Summary is a bit weaker than I'd use. It's the most efficient unification because that's where we're understanding, I think, is it one of the sources where we think we understand something when we seen the connections between a lot of different things. So, but but that's, uh, I'm glad you asked it that way because I think I should make that clear that I, I like the idea of reminding people that the Lewis laws are just, you know, they're just, ordinary, they're just statements. They just happen to become laws because they're part of an efficient, most efficient summary. So there's nothing metaphysically special about them. I like to emphasize that, but I do think that calling them a summary deflates them too much because after all, not all summaries are get connected with explanation. Right, okay. So so like for Lewis, like you typically cash it out in terms of like a conversation with God and you say like, give me as much information about the mosaic as you can as quickly as possible. And I guess for you, the question would be somewhat different, right? It would be, give me something that unifies this mosaic. Okay. So my friend, David Albert, who may or may not be here anymore, I'm not sure. But he, he has a great quote of a conversation with God. And unfortunately, that got associated with my view too, okay? But, but when I thought about it, I, in the thing I wrote, I quote this long quote, and I said, well, this gets of course, you know, the basic idea, so everybody else knows here. So imagine you ask God, God, tell me the best summary of the world so that I can find out where the best pastrami sandwiches in Montreal are and stuff like that, things you really want to know. Okay, that's not what David says exactly, but that's the, the, the taste of it, so to speak. And, and um, uh, I think that's not the way to think about it. We have other ideas about what understanding and unification is, and that's what we're interested in. Now you might then ask the question, why are we interested in them? And I think there you've got to probably give uh, cultural, historical, cognitive science explanations if you want to give an explanation, which is probably not what you're looking for. You're looking for some normative explanation, but I'm not sure you can do that. Great, okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Logan, uh, you're next. Yes, thanks. Um, you know, I'm, 
this discussion of laws makes me think of something which is very contemporary, which is um, laws of grammar in natural language. We know that there are clearly patterns of natural language grammar. And for a long time, computer scientists thought that the best way to teach computers language was to explicitly teach the computers the language, the rules, in a sense, the laws of human language. But it turns out that in fact, a, a statistical approach where you don't teach the computer anything almost, seems to almost work better. And you know, I was thinking about Noah's point of the example of the Conway game of life. Uh -huh. you, you peer in a large language model, you don't see any rules for grammar. You don't see any, and I'm just wondering, you know, I think part of Lewis's argument rests on the notion that having these systematic best, um, uh, uh, almost compressed uh, descriptions of the world are actually useful for some things. But I wonder if maybe this is suggesting that they're not, I don't know. So I wondered if, if sort of laws of language. Well, what, among the way he wants to do it is he, he by introducing probability and he allows for statistical ones too. Right, but I think what's striking about you know the way these these large language models are trained is that is that there's no attempt to actually encode any of what what we humans have discovered to be the the laws of grammar, right? In other words, you just statistically feed it a larger quantity of text, and it extract statistical patterns. Um, but if you peer inside these neural nets, there's no, there is no simplification on some level, right? And I wonder if, or maybe there is, but. Uh, so I, we'd have to have a longer conversation for me to understand how this analogy is working in the case of the, of the you know, fundamental physics. I thought, and I think this is related, I was just having a conversation the other day with somebody who was telling me about recent work about grammar, in which it turns out that there are all sorts of what seems to be regularities in grammar, which looks like they can't fit in with a sort of like rules model. And I think that's what might've been in, connected to what you were saying at any rate. And I thought that's pretty interesting. I, I don't remember right now some of the examples he's giving me. That's all very interesting. So here we have our world. Our world looks at first like all these things go on, but we notice certain regularities at the macroscopic level. We get interested in them. We get interested in them for quite practical reasons at first. It's good to know where our next meal will come from or where, so that we're not the next meal for some creature. It's good to know the regularities in our world and many, 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 many others. We see that they themselves form parts of systems of regularities. We get to the idea that maybe the whole thing fits into a big gigantic bunch of irregularities among some system about just a few things that make everything else up. Now, I don't think there's any guarantee that our world turned out to be like that, but our world looks like it is like that. At least that's the program that physics has been, has been following. But I can imagine somebody saying, you know, this wasn't the best idea. Maybe the best idea was to just to fit a lot of data and, and, and just get statistical regularities and let computers tell us what will happen next. In fact, my world is becoming such that pretty much when I'm going to find out what I'm going to do the rest of the day, I just ask my computer anyway. So, so I'm, not, I'm not sure. And so I can imagine, but that, that's not science. That could be a, a way to go. And maybe a thousand years from now, people will say, those dopey people back in the 20th century and the 54, they thought they were looking for a final theory of everything. But you know, the whole thing crashed and burned. Even Nancy Cartwright wasn't right. What they should have been doing is something like Bayesian nets, I don't know, about the world, maybe. So Logan, if I can just um, ask, are, are you imagining like, so when you think about these, these, uh, these, these systems, um, are you thinking of them as like, Law, lawful looking systems, systems that e exhibit what look like lawful behavior. But in this case, we have no reason to think that there are simple laws governing them. Like they behave predictably, there are regularities in their behavior, but this is like uh, an existence proof of a system that we, we've built ourselves and yet we don't think there are any simple laws in them. I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's a computational system. We know it's run on a computer. 
and it follows a it follows. But it follows a, very a, complicated, very totally different laws. And right. the lawful regularities we see are not coming from simple underlying laws, even though these things can behave in a very predictable way. I, I see. Yeah, that's an interesting way to understand this. What I would say is in this case, you've set it up in a way so we know that what generates it is one thing and the best summary is a different thing. What I'm saying is we don't know what generates the basic facts about our world, if anything generates them. We do have this idea of regularities and this idea of laws. And I'm proposing, following Lewis, a way of understanding the laws. Another thing I should have made clear, I don't think that this account, maybe it was clear, really, it's like when it was brought up about whether you're an eliminativist or, re, or a revisionist about some concept. This is eliminating some features of the notion of the laws, namely the governing generating part, and instead holding on to the systematizing part. And then of course you can recreate the generating part within the system of laws via the notion of causation. But it now itself is a, is a reducible to laws plus facts notion. So we're gonna to have to cut it off there because uh, I got to run to my next my next uh, engagement. But hey, thanks, so Barry. Thanks. That was fun, a lot of fun. Great. That was a and great talk. Who wants the email? I'm happy to know more because I I want to finish this goddamn book and fix it up and get all the footnotes right and stuff like that. But I, I'll fix up other things. If anyone wants to tell me anything, I'd be interested. Or send you the manuscript if you want to. Right.